As we continue through the time after Epiphany, stories of the call to discipleship show us the implications of our baptismal calling to show Christ to the world. Jesus begins proclaiming the good news and calling people to repentance right after John the Baptist is arrested for preaching in a similar way. Knowing that John was later executed, we see at the very outset the cost of discipleship. Still, the two sets of brothers leave everything they have known and worked for all their lives to follow Jesus and fish for people. Good morning and welcome to Worship on Sunday, January 24th, 2021. Just a couple of announcements before we begin with the service. First, um, with our prayer concerns, we need to continue to keep Liz Wirtz, the daughter-in-law of Irma and Arnold Wirtz, in, her, in our prayers, um, and her husband John as well. Liz is uh, suffering from a recurrence of brain cancer, so we want to keep that family in our prayers and thoughts. And also we want to add Lois Will to the list. Lois is the sister of Laura Whaley, who has tested positive for COVID this past week. So please keep Lois and her family in your prayers. Um, once again, I will remind you that we will be delivering communion elements to your homes on February 13th, Saturday, February 13th. If you are able to pick yours up in the Circle Drive at the church between 9.30 and 10.30 on that morning, it would be greatly appreciated. At 10.30, we will send our group of very wonderful volunteers out to deliver um, communion elements to your homes. So expect that package on your front porch on the 13th. Um, if you do not want the communion elements, please let me know that by emailing me. Also, if you are able to pick yours up and want to let me know that so I can have it set aside for you, email me as well. And also, if you are willing to join the group of volunteers to help deliver, please email me that information as well. My email address, as you probably all know, is dudley at firstlutheronkc.com. That's D-U-D-L-E-Y at F-I-R-S-T-L-U-T-H-E-R-A-N-K-C.com. So please uh, email me if you're willing to pick up your communion elements, help deliver elements, and or don't want them 
at all. So we don't deliver those to your home um, needlessly. So I hope to see you all soon. Please stay safe and healthy and enjoy the service. Welcome and blessings to you this day in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins, and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for what we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone, you call us and accept us into your service. Strengthen us by your Spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the third chapter of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. 
and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The Word of the Lord. Today's psalm is the 5th through the 12th verse of the 62nd psalm. For God alone I wait in silence. Truly, my hope is in God. God alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall never be shaken. In God is my deliverance and my honor. God is my strong rock and my refuge. Put your trust in God always, O people. Pour out your hearts before the one who is our refuge. Those of high degree are but a fleeting breath. Those of low estate cannot be trusted. Placed on the scales together, they weigh even less than a breath. Put no trust in extortion. In robbery, take no empty pride. Though wealth increase, set not your heart upon it. God has spoken once, twice have I heard it, that powers belongs to to God. Steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay all according to their deeds. The second reading is from the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. Today's gospel is from the first chapter of Mark. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent, and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. One of the most ancient symbols that the church has used to describe itself is the image of the ship. The central part of the church is even called the nave. From the same Latin root, we get the word navy. And often in church architecture, they will help along this metaphor 
by having a high and curved roof resembling the curving lines of a seagoing vessel. What do ships have to do with the church? Well, there are plenty of biblical comparisons. One of the more popular in the writings of the ancient church fathers was the comparison of the church to the Ark of Noah. As the Ark once bore up God's faithful people and transported them from the destruction of the great flood to a place of life and safety, so the church takes us out of the brokenness of the world and into God's promised future. There are other stories involving ships, of course, when the disciples and Jesus were journeying by ship, and as they were almost overcome by the waves and totally overcome by fear, Jesus rebuked his disciples, saying, You of little faith. And then he rebuked the waves, so that they traveled on a calm sea, and the disciples were reminded with whom they traveled. Once when the disciples had sailed on without Jesus, he came walking to them on the sea. And Peter was able to share in that miracle for a brief moment, walking out to meet Jesus on the water, until his faith began to fail him, and he started to sink. And then in a perfect picture of Lutheran thought on the nature of the gospel, Jesus reaches out and catches him. Not who had passed the test, but he whose faith had failed. Jesus helps to safety. And then, of course, there are today's first reading and gospel. Central to the story of Jonah is that he boards a ship heading away from God's will and is overcome by a tempest and swallowed by a great fish. In that fish belly time, he is incubated into being someone who follows after God rather than runs away from God. And he is born anew as a prophet as he is vomited forth on the shores of wicked Nineveh. And our gospel reminds us that the first disciples were fishermen whom Jesus called away from their nets and their boats and their fathers to follow him. As the gospel is written, it seems as though they went through no internal debate about who they were or what they were called to do with their lives. But immediately, as the gospel of Mark is prone to say they left behind all that they had been in order to follow Christ. There's an echo of contrast here with another story, the story of the rich young ruler who once went to see Jesus wanting to become a disciple. After telling Jesus that he had striven to follow the commandments his whole life, Jesus tells him, you lack but one thing. Sell all that you have Give the money to the poor, and then come and follow me. And as we read that story, we wish to scream into the pages of Scripture, Do it! Do it! No one will remember how much money you had. You have the chance to follow Jesus. But it was not meant to be. The rich young ruler could not disentangle himself, his sense of his own identity, from the things he owned. And the Bible tells us that he went away sad. Jesus will suggest with his teaching following this event that the rich have a harder time embracing God's will and God's kingdom because they're so tied to their wealth. His first fishermen disciples perhaps had less to leave behind, but surely the sacrifice they make is quite real as well. They may not be leaving behind a great treasure, but to leave boat and net and father is no small matter because those things amount to a life a vocation, a family, a task, an identity. And immediately, they walk away from all of it because Jesus has called them. There is at the heart of these thoughts a calling for us toward a sort of holy discomfort, a righteously uprooted way of living. To be the people of the nave, the people who are always willing to leave behind the lives we used to live, the people we used to be, old worn-out sins and old worn-out prejudices and injustices, and to be on the way towards God's promised and preferred future. Some of the things we leave behind are things that might otherwise give us comfort. In the case of the rich young ruler, it was wealth. He wasn't ready to embrace the freedom and discomfort that following Jesus demanded. 
Sometimes it's our sins that we're called to leave behind. Sins that have held us back for so long that they're now comfortable. And it's hard to imagine our lives without them. But that's exactly what we're called to do. To imagine what freedom in the name of Jesus looks like. And to set out towards that new life in freedom. Folks who have dealt with addiction know these things better than most. A person can have their life very much mangled and held back because of a substance. But using that substance is the very comfort that gets them through the day. Those who find freedom from addiction find it by getting up and leaving behind the comfortable and the familiar to set out to a place that they don't know about, embracing the journey, embracing the holy discomfort of doing something brand new, of being uprooted for the sake of freedom. There's no better image of what this can sometimes feel like than the image of Israel and their desert wandering as they complain against Moses. God had intervened mightily in the human story to make them free. They had crossed the Red Sea on dry land while the waters destroyed their former masters. But then they grow hungry. And then they grow scared and begin to doubt even after they had seen all that they had seen. Oh, that we had died in Egypt, they say, where at least we had meat to eat. You, Moses, have brought us out in this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. When faced with trouble, they actually long to be slaves again. The freedom that they were living in brought them discomfort, and they turned back and looked to Egypt and to that slavery that it so recently seemed so odious and now at least looks comfortable. They were used to the trials of being slaves. They were not used to the trials that this new freedom had brought them and they began to doubt. Like Peter, slowly sinking beneath the waves as his faith wavers, they're ready to give up and go back to being what they used to be. But we know what happened. God sent them miraculous bread to eat. They called it manna because in Hebrew, manna means, what is it? God sustained them in their transition and they didn't turn back to slavery. They went ahead, strengthened by God to the promised land flowing with milk and honey, to be God's free people, to be teachers of God's word, to be the city on the hill where the whole world would learn of God's righteousness. When I was in seminary, very near the beginning of our studies, they gave us all this evaluation that measured the amount of change we were having to deal with. Certain life events were assigned a number. For instance, the death of a spouse was five points. Moving to a different city was two points. Changing jobs was one point, and so on. And if you were experiencing these events, you wrote down that number. And at the end, you added them up. And if the figure you arrived at was over a certain number, it meant that you were probably at risk for a major mental health crisis. One friend of mine was able to claim nearly every event on that sheet. And he joked with me that according to that paper, at least, he was long overdue for a breakdown. I dare say that all of us have gone through a lot of changes lately. Some of us are teaching our kids at home. Some of us are working from home. Some of our jobs have either been lost to us or drastically changed by what's going on in the world. We've not been able to do some of the things that in the past have been anchors for our comfort, traditions, including coming here to be, to the, be at the church together. COVID has affected our relationships in some cases with our spouses and our children, and on top of that, our nation has gone through protest and election and protest and attack and inauguration. And on top of that, all those things that we're all experiencing, each of us also have our own individual trials that perhaps only we know about. And the more stress we experience, the more we fear change. The more we might long to go back to the old things, even if they were bad. We don't want discomfort even if it's holy and even if it's for the best. Make us slaves again, where at least we ate our fill. 
And God's word for us today is to not let discomfort rob us of our freedom. Jesus has called us. We are the people of the nave, even when we can't be in the nave. We place our trust in God, and instead of using discomfort as the excuse to turn back, we see discomfort as the evidence that we are truly following God to a better place. Evidence that we're truly leaving behind the old comforts and the old sins that held us back, leaving behind old ways of living to be reborn out of our discomfort. Whether we're taking our first steps as disciples or our hundredth step, the message for us today is the same. Don't turn back now, children of God, but press on, for we cannot even imagine what God has in store for us just over the horizon. Amen. Now let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, 
Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us now offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world, for pastors and teachers, for deacons and deaconesses, and for musicians and servers, that all proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For skies and seas, for birds and fish, for favorable weather and clean water, and for the well-being of creation. That God raise up advocates to guide our care for all the earth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who provide leadership in our cities and around the world, especially for our new president, Joe, for nonprofit and non-governmental organizations, for planning commissions and homeless advocates, that God inspire all people in the just use of wealth. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For those who are sick, distressed, or grieving, for all the outcasts and all who await relief, especially those we now name aloud or in our hearts. That in the midst of suffering, God's peace and mercy surround them. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. For First Lutheran and our extended community, for families big and small, for the organizations that use our facilities now paused because of COVID, that God's steadfast love serve as a model for all our relationships. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. In thanksgiving for our ancestors in the faith, whose lives serve as an example of gospel living, that they point us to salvation through Christ. Let us pray. Have mercy, O oh God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
Now let us pray using the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thank you.